Hey guys, all right. Well, you see, this is what happens when you try to do something for the first time. You know, a lot of people tell me, Sanjay, we use your presentation. It didn't work. Well, that's because you tried it once. And that's exactly what just happened with me. My name is Dr. Sanjay Tulani, for those of you who don't know me. And the purpose of doing a live is primarily to help you understand what to do in quarter four of 2019. Now, if you want to watch some of my videos, you can see them on YouTube. It's very easy. You can just go down there and see it. If you want to get some of my mailing material, which I would send across to you, join the mailing list. Now, before I tell you what I'm teaching you today, I want to give you a little update. 2019 is a phenomenal year, but there were a few things that did go wrong. Uh, number one was, I've always been struggling with quarter four. Uh, last year, I did not hit my target. So I want to change my strategy for quarter four, and that's what I wanted to share with you today. Last year, I also had a strategy, which I worked quite hard with. However, there were things that didn't work out, and I will have enough things to blame. I would either blame my circumstances, I'll blame my company, I'll blame somebody, right? That's human nature, and that's what I pretty much do. But I didn't want to do that. So 2019, I changed my strategy. And just wanted to share with all of you guys, I've actually hit my target for 2019. So there was a strategy that I used, and I want to share that strategy with you. Now, anything you do for the first time, like I said, you will make mistakes. It's about how do you learn from there and move on. Wow, okay. Hi guys, okay, I've got, wow, so many people from different countries. That's so awesome. Uh, from the Philippines, from from Singapore, from India. Wow, we've got somebody even from Mexico. Isn't that like really early in the morning for you? Uh, well, it's good to have you guys. And before I get to training you on certain materials, I want you all to know that every year is a challenging year. And every year is a new start. Because what you did last year, only some of it carries into the next year. The next year, again, becomes a new year for you. So you need to always be in mind that whatever you do this year, you will again have to restart next year. So let's make sure that this year ends really well because whatever happens next year, happens next year. It is very little of this year that goes into next year. So let's focus on the strategy that you need to do for this year. Um, sales will come and go. Let me get that across to you. It's the one thing about sales is there are days when you just expect that that case will close. You've been working hard on it, you've sat with your clients, you've done a lot of stuff, but for some reason that sale doesn't go through. And when that sale doesn't go through, we end up spending time trying to figure out what went wrong. I'm not a trainer. I'm, I'm not here to tell you that's the way to do it. No, I, I'm a practitioner just like you. And the days when I lose my cases, I feel down as well. We all have those good days and bad days. And when you have those bad days, what usually happens is we will sit by ourselves, try to figure things out, or we will go out and meet with your family and you know tell them about it. So similar thing happened with me a few years ago. I was working on a very big case did everything literally to a point where now it was just about the client having to pay his premium. Everything done, client says, you know what Sanjay, I was trying to do it, but let's just pause it for now. And I was like, why? I mean, everything's done. You know the purpose, you know how important it is. Stop. I came back and I was absolutely depressed about it. I sat down with my father and my dad said, well, the question is, how long are you going to suffer with a non-decision? And I said, Dad, I've worked really hard on this case. And he said, well, yeah, we all do. We all work hard. I said, so what do you want me to do? He said, well, number one, go take a big shower. Spend some time under the water. Get rid of the bad vibes that you have. Get rid of that negativity. So I went for a long shower, came back, and then he said, now what am I supposed to do? He said, now you go and meet someone you like. So that's one of the mistakes we make. We try to become introverted. We try to spend time alone, try to introspect on what you could have done differently. And it actually puts you into a spiral of negativity. 
This was the strategy that I used, that sales will come, sales will go. But what you need to do is keep doing what your purpose is. And your purpose is to be meeting people. Don't ever lose that drive. Don't lose the drive to meet people. Because the day you stop meeting people, you will start to lose sales. And that's what I want to share with you, was sales will come, sales will go. You need to focus on yourself. Um, hi, we've got Vivian from Malaysia. Excellent. Um, we've got so many people here. All right. Now, one thing that I do want to share with you in Q4 uh, is for those of you who have not figured this out, but Q4 is probably the most productive quarter for every single person in our industry. Because Q4 is where you have the opportunity to spend time meeting people. It is bonus season. A lot of people get end of year bonuses. A lot of people are re-looking at their finances before the new year starts. So Q4 is actually one of the most important quarters of the year for you. And if you haven't figured that out yet, we need to put together a strategy that you can use immediately going forward. For all the ones who are coming back for the first time, my name is Dr. Sanjay Tolani. I've been in the business for a long time and uh, it's, it's just all about making sure that we share this with our family. The whole mentoring family is going to learn today on what I do for Q4. If you want your friends to learn, share this and tag three of your friends because that way we can spread this knowledge. I'm not a trainer guys. Let me share with you exactly what I've been doing and I want to share exactly step by step what I've done for the last few months. I started my Q4 a little early this year because I wanted to test the strategy before I shared it with you. If I can't hit my targets and I share a strategy with you with, that I'm not sure of, then it's just irresponsible of me to share that strategy with you. So before I shared that strategy, I actually did my plans. Hey, we've got guys from Zambia as well. That's one country I want to visit one day. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Africa as a child. My father used to live in Africa, so I have some beautiful memories of Africa. And I'm so glad we've got some people over here from Africa. Wow. Hi, Bhagyashree. I am also from Pune. I studied four years of high school in Pune, so I have some very beautiful memories down there. Excellent. All right. Now, before I move on, I want to do a giveaway. So even before we start, I want to do a giveaway. I want you to tell me which book of mine do you like and why do you like it? And if I like your answer, I'll probably give you a book for free. So if you like which book of mine do you want and which one do you like? And why do you like it? If you tell me that, I will give it away for free. So do leave me that as a comment so I know exactly what you have there. Now, one of the other things that I want to share today before we even move on is understanding the sales process that we use, right? The sales process that we use has a certain key factors. Number one is understanding what your clients want. So we've always been down the route of doing what we call fact finding. I want to get one thing very clear. Fact finding is a very important part of the sales process, but it is not the start of the sales process. Because when you start asking some very personal questions, I'll give you an example. Let's say someone comes to you, even your best friend comes up to you and says, by the way, how much do you earn every month? It just sounds very random. So, Going down the route of fact finding is important, but fact finding has to be done at the right time. It is not the start of your sales process. The start of your sales process always starts with why should a person buy from you? Number one. Number two, why should a person even think about financial planning? I mean, what's the purpose of financial planning? Let's get that very clear. Everyone earns an income. Am I correct? Now, if you earn an income, what is the purpose of that income? It's supposed to provide you for your lifestyle, etc. So shouldn't we be planning what happens with that money? That is financial planning. So let's do financial planning in a very easy words. 
you sit down with the client and they say, Mr. Client or Miss Client, I need to do financial planning. Well, that's great. What should I do? Well, you need to first budget yourself. Yeah, I budgeted myself. Do you know where you're spending your money? Yeah, I kind of have an idea of where I'm spending my money. And that's where you go down the route of fact finding, but that's not what really is financial planning. Financial planning is identifying what is your source of your income, understanding the source of your income, finding out what can stop that source of income, and then finding out what are you going to use that source of income for. So that's the last step. We have already gone to the last step. Step number one is identifying sources of income. Understanding where these incomes can get stopped. What could stop that income from coming? If you have not handled the source of income first, going on what you should do with that income is very, very secondary, which is what a lot of people focus on, where you should budget yourself. Long before budgeting, let's talk about your income. Is your source of income a business or is it passive income like a rental property? Is it income which you're getting from a salary? So what is your source of income? Once we have the source of income, you can now find out what can affect that source from starting, stopping, or getting paused. It's not always that income will continue to flow. There are times when income could all of a sudden stop. It could be economic crisis. It could be illness. It could be death. It could be loss of an asset. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what causes the loss or what could stop the income. If you've identified what could stop the income, you can handle that very easily. So get to know one thing for sure. What is your source of income? Now, I've got someone saying the objection label because it helps us prepare bullets to the war. Guys, it's not war. Uh, when you are having a conversation with a client, it's not war. It's about showing them the purpose of you being in their life. It's just like, why do you need a family doctor? Or why do you need to have a medical doctor looking after your family forever? The reason is you're able to communicate with that doctor on all the small, minute details, intimate details that are affecting your daily lifestyle. And they can monitor your progress. Every year you would go for a regular health checkup. Once you've finished that health checkup, doesn't mean you need to take medicines. It only means, are you on right track? Is your health fine? It's not fine, the doctor will say, hey, you've got some time, figure it out. Or, guys, we've reached a point where you cannot go back, you need to start taking some medication take on some help. So it depends on where you are with your, with your own money. It's exactly the same thing. You need to do annual reviews. You need to do annual checkups. So no, it's not war. It's about making sure that you understand what is the purpose of you being in their life. If you understand the purpose of why you're in their life, it will change your entire strategy. All right, we have a lot of people who have just joined us. For those of you who have just joined us, Hi, my name is Dr. Sanjay Tolani and today's purpose is primarily to share with you how to increase your sales and your income in quarter four. And for those of you who have already seen my videos or don't know about my videos, there are a lot of free videos that, you, that are available on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and watch them. If you want to get them directly into your inbox, join the mailing list and that's the whole purpose. Now, what I'm sharing today is the strategy that I'm using for quarter four that you should be using for yourselves. Uh, all right, we've got people coming in from South Africa. Wow, nice. Hi, guys. All right. And so coming back to what I was talking about, the start of your sales process is about identifying what is your purpose in your client's life. So step number one is always about why they should be buying financial planning products. That could be insurance, that could be investments. So the choice of your the choice is different, but the answer is the question is why should they be doing it? That's number one. Now, even before you get to the why, there was a question that was asked, which I do want to address. Sanjay, how do I do prospecting? So let's start with the most basic strategy, which is about prospecting. Prospecting. Imagine a doctor comes to your door and then just knocks on the door and says, Hi, I'm a doctor. Do you need some medical advice? What do you think is the usual reaction? The usual reaction is, all right, so why are you not in your clinic? Yeah, that's true. So how does it feel when you go knocking on a stranger's door? Now I know that has been the old strategy of the 20th century. We today live in a very connected world. So we are already available. We can find out about people a lot more easier than we did in the past. So 
I'm not saying cold calling is bad. It's just that it's a strategy that hasn't worked very well for me. Uh, it might have worked for you, so I'm not saying it's bad. All I'm saying is it's not my strategy. If you want to know my prospecting strategy, I'll share that with you. It's quite simple. Number one, I work with people I know. Um, number two, I work with people who I'm usually recommended to. So if a client recommends me someone, I would work with them. Because we all have quite a large social network today, given social media, it's very easy to reconnect with some of your old contacts who you've not been able to stay in touch with in the past. So previously, you would all have a phone book. Well, now today we all have our own Facebook pages. We have our own strategies in terms of uh, you know, being connected on LinkedIn, we've got people connected with us on Instagram. So when they're connected with us on so many strategies, it's easy for us to understand how to get reconnect with people. I mean, I found so many old friends from school, which were on my Facebook, which I was not able to speak to previously. So why am I sharing this with you? When you trust a doctor, you automatically go to them for advice. So I want you to become that trustworthy doctor first. Step number one is learn to give advice that is good quality advice. Once you have achieved the strategy of being able to give good advice, don't worry about clients coming to you. If you are a good doctor, clients will come to you. Now, sometimes you have to go out and meet with your patients, which is very important as well. Knowing when do you leave your office and go and meet. Please stop going to the office. Spend more time outside your office. There is nobody in your office who's going to be buying insurance from you. Your team is not going to buy insurance from you. Your staff is not going to buy insurance from you. Go out and meet your friends. Go out and meet your contacts. Go and meet people. That's step number one in prospecting, meeting people. If you don't have the activity of meeting people, it's very difficult to even start opening what we call a sales process. So go out and do that. Right. Now, all right, so for those of you who are just coming on, uh, welcome to this. We've got two things to do. Number one is if you want more of your team or your friends to learn about today's training session, share this video, tag three friends and you could be winning some tickets for the final sprint or some of the books tonight. Uh, I will be giving away a lot of free books today. Great, now, wow, we've got some people from Nepal here as well. That's great, awesome. Now coming back to um, something that I want to be, which I'm very passionate about is my presentations. You see, uh, how do you explain the concept of insurance? So if I went to a five-year-old child, so I'm going to make this very simple for you. Let's say you meet up with a five-year-old child. How would you explain insurance to them? That's one of the most difficult things to do. When you cannot explain insurance to a child, you cannot explain insurance to a client. I want you all to understand one thing very simple. Our clients might be the most intelligent people in their own businesses. But a lot of them don't understand what is the purpose of buying insurance. And if you cannot explain to a child what you do, you're going to have a very tough time explaining to a client why they need to do it. So I want you all to go and practice this. I want you to go to your children in your own family first. And I want you to ask them, if, they have, if you have got kids of your own, I want you to go and ask them, child, what do you think your daddy or your mommy do? And you will be surprised on the answers you get. And I want you all to learn how to share with your own children or with the children in your house, what do you do? That's a very good way to practice. You see, they are the people who will listen to you without any objection. They will listen to you and try to understand what you're trying to say without any objection. These are your easiest stakeholders as we call them. They are wanting to know what you do. So I want you to spend a little time today to just go to your own child and say, exactly what do you do? And if you can't explain it to your own child, you know your presentation is wrong. And that's a very interesting strategy to use to explain to others what you do. So I know that you have these elevator pitches that you want to practice on, but before you build an elevator pitch, try it out. You know, when you hear words in your own head, 
they are very different when you say them and they are very different when you write them. So I want you to spend some time to write down how would you explain to a child what do you do. So I want you to do that. Now, one of the other things that I want to share today with you is about how to build your own presentations. Because if you're not good with your presentations, you're not able to explain to your client what you can do, you're going to have a tough time. So if you have the concept presentation playbook, I want you to turn to page number 23. Now on page number 23, I've already written down the sales cycle. So I'm going to read this out to you so it's easy for you to understand. Now, step number one is prospecting. That is what I covered. Step number two is always about presentation. Step number three is knowing how to handle objections. Step number four is making sure that you've closed the deal. And step number five is finding out, is there a potential upsell, cross-sell, or a way for you to maximize that meeting? So it always starts down with prospecting. Now I've shared with you what my prospecting strategy is. The second part is on presentations. Now, in presentations, there are five different types of presentations. So I'm not gonna cover all five today, but I'm gonna come up with you what the five types are so you can spend some time to build it for yourself. Now, this is already on page number, yeah. It's on page number 79. The five different ways of doing presentations, either you use an object as an example, you use nature as an example, you use a profession as an example, or you do a technical presentation for those of your clients who are investment savvy, or you use one of your family values as an example. But make sure your presentations are short, simple, easy to execute. Because if your presentations are difficult to understand, nobody, nobody is going to spend time listening to you. Don't spend 30 minutes doing a presentation. Your presentation should not be longer than seven minutes. So that is already pushing the limits. The ideal amount of time that you should spend doing presentations or explaining why they should be buying insurance should be between three to maximum four minutes. Nothing more than that. Um, if you're spending more time than that, you're already in trouble. So let me give you an example of objects. Um, you have a car. In your car, would you drive a car that doesn't come with seat belts and an airbag? Well, not in today's times. Because that's the most basic safety features that you want in your car. An uh, airbag and a safety belt. Well, you see, life insurance is nothing but an airbag. If you hit the wall, the airbag opens up and protects all the other passengers in the car. The safety belt is just like a critical illness or an income protection plan. When everything all of a sudden just pauses, there's a there's a strong break that comes into your life, the seatbelt ensures you don't go flying out of the window. And that's the purpose of a seatbelt. You have already paid for it. Now think about it. All of us already have seatbelts in our car. The question is, do we use the seatbelts? You have already paid for the seatbelt. Think about it. I want you to think about this. You have already paid for the seatbelt in your car. The question is, do you use it? It's exactly the same with insurance. If you don't buy insurance, you are doing what we call self-insurance. You're already paying for it by make, building a surplus on the side. So insurance is purchased the day you're born. Either you have kept the risk with you or you have transferred the risk to an insurance company. The choice is yours. It's exactly the same when it comes to a seatbelt. If you wear the seatbelt, you have transferred the risk of the brake onto the seatbelt. If you don't wear the seatbelt, even though it's already there, you're holding on to the responsibility that if there's a strong break, your body will protect you. So the choice is yours. You've already paid for it. The question is, do you want to transfer the risk or hold on to the risk? The choice is yours. Would you drive a car? Would you want your children to wear a seatbelt or not wear a seatbelt? The question is yours to answer, not mine. You see, when you make something as simple as that, your presentation, your clients will understand what you do. So I want you to spend some time to build presentations of your own. Now, when I'm looking at uh, another object, which is a very, one of my favorite presentations that I use is, all of us travel in an aircraft. When we travel in an aircraft, the first safety vi video that they show you is, 
If the cabin pressure falls down, oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling. Help yourself even before you help your own children. So I know a lot of parents focus on buying insurance for their children. What they forget is if they are not protected, they cannot protect their loved ones. So help yourself before you help others. Before you start saving plans for your children, make sure your income is protected. So simple things like that can be used as examples. You have the oxygen mask. Now all these things are things that we all forget. These are simple analogies to explain what you do, how you do it, and when you should do it. The other thing that I want you all to understand is when you're doing presentations, you can even use uh, nature as an example. Uh, one of my favorite nature examples is the tree and roots presentation. Now this video is already on YouTube, so if you haven't watched it, let me just give it to you. It's a very simple presentation. The tree's size is dependent on how strong the roots are. The stronger the roots, the taller the tree becomes. If the roots are weak, the trees cannot grow very tall. So that's understanding what exactly happens. Once the roots are there, the tree will grow. So let me draw this example for you. Now, this is a tree. And every tree, every tree has roots. Now if you look at the roots, the stronger the roots are, the taller the tree will grow. Right? The stronger the roots, the taller the tree will grow. If the tree is cut from the top, but the roots are not cut, the tree will grow back because the roots will ensure that the tree grows back. But if the roots are cut, the tallest trees will fall down. Now what is roots and what is tree? Roots is your income and tree is your assets. If your income is strong, the tree will grow back. But if your income is stopped, all of a sudden the best of assets will fall down. So this is the root and tree problem. How do you protect your roots? Well, the formula is very simple. You have to follow the rules of thumb. Now, I've already written the rules of thumb down and most of you should already know it because I've shared this many times on social media. It's on page number, let me give it to you as well. The rule of, rule of thumb is on page number 76. For life insurance, you should be buying 10 times of your annual income. For critical illness or income protection, you should be buying five times of your annual income. And for retirement planning, you should be saving 20% of whatever you earn. And for your kids' education, you should be saving anywhere between two to 5% of whatever you earn. That's the rule of thumb. It's just like knowing how much water should you drink in a day. You see, one of the biggest problems that we have is, as an industry, we haven't written down what are the rules of thumb that everyone should follow. So that's the reason why I wrote down these rules of thumb. How much life insurance should a person buy? If you don't have that clear and your clients ask you, how much insurance should I buy? And you don't know the answer to that question, we already have a problem. So I want you to write this down for yourself. What is the amount of rules of thumb? So get that across. Now, wow. We've got All right, we've got guys from Hong Kong here. Hi, Kathy. It's good to see you from Hong Kong. I know we have met before. Excellent. Mahesh, I need to come to Nepal. That is a beautiful country. I have loved, I have heard so many nice things about you. Um, Arita, it's good to see you again. I am glad you like the seatbelt example. You see, it's something that I've been using for a long time, but I've just not had the time to document all these down. Guys, I'm not a trainer. You see, the thing is, is I'm a practitioner and I'm selling insurance every day and I'm giving financial advice and doing financial planning for a lot of families around the world. And that's what I do. So whatever I'm sharing with you, I've not had the time for such a long time to do a live uh, Facebook video because I just don't have the time to do it. I'm also selling insurance and meeting with my clients every day. So today when I got some time, I said, you know what, why don't I share with you exactly what I've done over this quarter. 
I'm very glad that I've been able to hit my targets and I thought I'd share that with you as well. So if you've just come on, my name is Dr. Sanjay Tolani and today's purpose is primarily to see how you can increase your sales in quarter four. Now, for those of you who have not seen my videos, you can just go to YouTube, you can watch them, they're free. And for those of you who want to get them directly into your inbox, join the mailing list and my team will send across the videos to your mail list. Um, I do want to do one thing is, I would love to know which book of mine you would want to have and why would you want to have it and I would probably give it away to you for free. So I will be choosing some lucky winners today on who gets which book for free. Gaurav, I'm, great. I'm glad you like the tree example. Uh, it's This tree example is already on YouTube so I've already put up a video on the roots and tree presentation. So if you want to know the exact word by word script that I use for the roots and tree presentation, you can see it on YouTube. It's one of the most easy ways to explain what you do. To be honest, it's the easiest presentation to do. Out of all my presentations, this is one of my favorite presentations because it's very simple for even a child to understand that if the roots are not strong, the trees will fall down. And the only thing our job is, is to protect the roots. Because as long as the roots are there, the trees will grow back. And that's what we focus on. It's not about the fruits, it's about the roots. All right. Great. Now, um, some of the other presentations that I would like to talk to you about are simple presentations. I have clients who tell me, Sanjay, I don't understand about insurance. Well, let me use another object which I love to use. How many of you like to eat chocolates? You see, imagine you're going to eat a chocolate and all of a sudden that chocolate falls down. What happens? Would you just pick it up and eat it? Probably not. But imagine the same chocolate has a wrapper on top of it and it falls down. What do you do? You just pick up, remove the wrapper and eat the chocolate. Mr. Client or Miss Client, you are the chocolate for your family. If something happens to you, it's going to be very difficult to recover from that. But if I put a small wrapper on top of that chocolate, if something happens, you can always pick it up, remove the wrapper and enjoy the chocolate. That's what we are. We are wrappers. If the chocolate is so big, the wrapper is that big. If the chocolate is very small, the wrapper is smaller. So depending on the size of the chocolate, the wrapper is decided. Now, to know what should be the size of the wrapper, the formula is very simple. 10 times of your annual income should be life insurance. About five times of your annual income should be for income protection. That should be the size of the wrapper. The bigger the chocolate, the bigger the wrapper. It's never about, oh Sanjay, my chocolate doesn't need a wrapper. Every chocolate needs a wrapper. The bigger the chocolate, the bigger the wrapper. So please keep that in mind. Small wrappers are not good for your own chocolates. And that's what a lot of clients don't understand is, why do you need to buy insurance? And I want that very clear across today to you. Um, the other thing that I do want to cover is how do you handle objections? Because when a client is giving you an objection, there are two types of objections. Objection number one is the type which is what we call an opening objection. Now, uh, for those of you who already have the objection planning playbook, if you open to page number 50, 51. Page number 51. You have the universal objection circle over here. Now, the universal objection circle, I've pretty much clarified what is the cycle that you follow. So it always starts down with, you need to first acknowledge the objection. A lot of clients will give you an objection which you don't acknowledge. So simple words like, I actually understand where you're coming from. These words are acknowledgement that you understand what they're trying to say. Step number two is you need to ask the right question. Not just any question, but asking the right question. So let me give you an example. Uh, if you go to page number 76, it's too expensive to buy this product. Well, acknowledge it first. Well, I understand where you're coming from, Mr. Client or Miss Client. However, what is, what is it expensive compared to? You see, there is no product that can be compared to life insurance. There is no product that does what life insurance does. Because 
let me ask you a question. The money that you're going to earn in the next 20, 30, 40 years of your working life, I create it instantly. That money actually doesn't exist. So there is no product in the world that does what life insurance does. It creates money that does not exist. So what is it expensive compared to? I want you to think about it. Then make sure that that example or that question is relatable to them. It is very important question that you need to address Mr. Client or Miss Client because I don't understand what you're comparing to and what to what makes it expensive. So simple words like that make your process simple. So I'm going to document this. I'm just going to draw this uh, objection circle for you so it's easy for you to understand. Yeah. Let me rub this out. All right. So the universal objection circle is broken into four parts. Now, you have to first of all acknowledge, so it's what you call, you need to acknowledge your client's objection. Number two is you need to ask the right question. If you don't ask the right question, you will not get the right response. Number three is you need to give a solution or an example. If you don't solve the objection, you don't solve what their question is, and you don't give an example for them to understand it, you're going to lose it. And then you have to make sure that it is relatable to them. So if it is not relatable to them, personally they don't get it, you have not handled the objection. So objection handling is a process. It is not a game of question and answers. It's a, it's a process that you have to follow with your client. Understanding what is the real objection, asking the right question. Because if you don't ask the right question, you have lost it. You need to give them a solution or an example to that objection and then you need to make sure that it's relatable to them personally. So if you haven't handled it that way, you will lose your client in terms of your objection. So let's come to objections. Um, I want you all to share with me what are the most common objections that you get. Put them into the comment section so I can handle them for you right now as we're talking. The other thing that I do want to cover is understanding that once you have been able to handle objections, for you to be able to close your clients, you need to be able to tell them exactly why they should be working with you. So there's a closing strategy. It's called the five-step decision tree or the three-step decision tree. So if you're selling a life insurance or an insurance product, there are five steps that a client needs to go through and that decision tree is how they make, how clients make a decision. The three-step decision tree is more towards investment products. All right, okay, sorry, my, my video just paused there for a second. Now, before I move on, I wanna give a giveaway to Marvin Richards. Well, Marvin, congratulations, you have won yourself the concept presentation playbook. So I'm gonna put that over there, Marvin. Congratulations. All right, now, if you want more of your friends to learn what I'm sharing today, Share this video, tag three friends, and I will be giving away more tickets and books later on. Now, some of the objections that have come in, I love them. Thank you very much for these. Um, I want to compare. All right. So this is one of the most common objections that you get, which is I want to compare with other companies. Follow the same UOC process. Let's start with acknowledgement. First of all, tell the client, I'm so glad you want to compare. There's nothing wrong in that. They should be comparing. But let me ask you a question. Did you know that almost all the insurance companies have exactly the same products? You see, we only have four products. Number one, you die, I pay. You fall sick, I pay. You retire, I pay. Your kids go to college, I pay. There is no fifth product. 
There are only four products. Now, all the insurance companies are very competitive. We live in an era where everyone is very, very competitive. So the price difference, and that's what you're comparing, will be between five to 10%. It's not gonna be a significant difference. But the more important question that you have to answer is, who would you like as your financial advisor? It's exactly like choosing a doctor. It's not about the medicine, it's about the doctor that you choose because medicines are pretty much the same. There's not much difference in the medicine. What's different is in the skill of the doctor. So what you need to do is choose the right doctor. Now for you, as a token of appreciation for spending time with me, why don't I do this for you? I will give you insurance for free for the next 14 days till you believe you have got time to compare. We have something called a free look period. While you are looking around, you have 14 days of free look or 21 days, depending on which country you're from. We all have a free look period. Let your clients exercise their right to have free insurance for 14 or 21 days, depending on which country you're in, for their peace of mind. There's nothing wrong in comparing. If they don't buy from you, they buy from someone else in the market, it's okay. Our industry succeeds, it doesn't matter. As long as we have protected more and more families, our profession will grow. So please focus on the professionalism of your advice, not on your product. And also be confident about one thing, majority of the products are the same. There are only four products in our industry. You die, I pay. You fall sick, I pay. You retire, I pay. Your kids go to college, I pay. There is no fifth product. Now, one of the other objections that just came up, which I love to handle, is I have no money. Well, First of all, you need to acknowledge it, right? So you've got to say, I understand where you're coming from, that you don't have any money, but let me ask you a question. If you don't have the money to pay for insurance, which is a few dollars, if something happens to you, your family is going to suffer even more. So why don't I do one thing for you? We're going to put your insurance on your credit card. You've got 30 days to figure it out. Start to put some money buy the cheapest product, buy a term product, it doesn't matter. I want you to buy the cheapest insurance product, but make sure that your family is protected because that is step number one. Buy the cheapest insurance, that is fine. The cheapest product that we have is a term product, which is temporary insurance. It is not permanent, it is a temporary product, but it covers you today because my biggest fear is if something happens to you today, your family is gonna suffer. You don't even have money to be able to afford to pay for insurance. So if you can't afford to pay for insurance, you can't afford to die. Think about it. That's how you handle that objection. It's actually that simple. If you don't have any money, you might as well buy temporary insurance because that's the only thing you can afford. And if something did happen to you, your family is going to suffer. And the formula is very simple. You need to still have 10 times of annual income as life insurance. That doesn't change. Start with a temporary cover. We will change it to permanent later but at least start with a temporary cover because something happens today, you are already in trouble. Uh, I don't want insurance. If that is an objection, that is not an objection. It only means your presentation did not work. If someone is telling you, I don't want insurance, what are they trying to tell you? Good enough. That is not an objection, guys. I don't want to buy insurance is not an objection. That is a lack of your quality of your presentation. So you need to spend more time building the quality of your presentation. Practice it again, practice it again, practice it again. And that's very, very important. Uh, I don't have done that. Um, the most common and hard objection we're handling is I don't need it. Well, you don't need it is because we haven't focused on your presentation, guys. That is really not an objection. That is basically a question that they don't agree with your presentation. So change your presentation. There are so many presentations and that's the reason why I said, if your presentations are short, two or three minute presentations, if they didn't like one presentation, in the next two or three minutes, you can do another presentation. In the, if they don't like that, you have the opportunity to do another. So up to three presentations you could have done within 10 minutes. If they didn't like the first one, they would like the second one. They don't like the second one, you could do a third one. But within 10 minutes, you have probably done three presentations. 
And that's why your presentation have to be very easy to understand, very quick to do, and very simple for even a child to be able to understand. So keep that in mind. Um, insurance is not a priority. Okay. Now, I understand that you think insurance is not a priority, but let me ask you this. Is your income a priority? Absolutely yes. If your income is a priority, I need to do everything in my power to protect your income. Now, a simple presentation can explain this objection or handle this objection. So this is what I call the technical presentation. It's already in the concept presentation playbook, but this is a very simple presentation that you can use with your clients. Everyone in life focuses on three things. Number one, food, clothing, and shelter. The three basic necessities of life. Food, clothing, and shelter. Now, your food, clothing, and shelter is based only on one variable, which is income. So your income decides the type of food you eat, your income decides the type of clothes you wear, <coughs> and your income decides the kind of house you live in. Now there are only two things that give you an income. It's either you work or I work. But I have a limitation. The only amount of work that I can do for you is I can provide you 10 times of your annual income in case you pass away. I can provide you 5 times of your annual income in case you fall sick. So if you can't work, I start to work because somebody has to work to keep providing the income for your food, clothing and shelter. So the choice is yours. Do you see how short this presentation is? It's less than a minute. It makes life very easy for them to understand. So. Okay, one of, the mo one of the common objections, so guys, thank you a lot for your comments because your comments are giving me a lot of uh, feedback that I can share with you. Like for example, one of the comments that I got is, uh, I want to survey first. Well, go ahead, I'm giving you 14 days free look. That's one way of handling it. I don't need insurance, that means your presentation wasn't good enough. That is not an objection. And the last one is, insurance is not giving profit. Well, insurance is not supposed to give a profit. The whole purpose of buying insurance is to protect your income. It is not for profit. It is to make sure that your income is protected. Insurance is not an investment. Insurance is not supposed to be compared to an investment because an investment is supposed to give you returns. An insurance product is supposed to protect what you already have. You cannot compare the two. You're comparing apples to oranges. Let me ask you a question. Can you compare property to a business? Can you compare your business to a fixed deposit? They are all different assets. You cannot compare them to each other. They all have a different purpose. They all have a different rate of return. Do you keep money in the current account? Yes. How much do you earn in the current account? Zero. How much do you earn in the savings account? A few percent points. So you can't compare apples to oranges. Each one of these assets is a different type of fruit. But when you put all these fruits together, you get the perfect fruit salad. Now this fruit salad is protected with insurance. That is what the purpose of insurance is, to protect all the fruits in your salad. That's what insurance does. So please understand, insurance is not for profit. Insurance is a mechanism to protect your income, which is the one source of all your fruits. All right, uh, guys, thanks a lot for your comments. I really appreciate that. Um, all right. I have another giveaway, and this is for Eric. 
Uh, you're going to get the retirement planning playbook because that's what you asked for. And Eric on Instagram, you're going to get that for you. Uh, congratulations. So I'll make sure my team has that sent across to you. Um, all right. Okay, this is a very nice objection. A client's objection is, um, I have none of the fears applied to me. I have a huge business assets. I have a lot of money in cash. I'm a shareholder in a listed company. Wow, exactly the type of clients that I work with. So let me give you an example. Is insurance for poor people or rich people? Let's get this very clear today. Is insurance made for poor people or for rich people? I want you to think about this. To break it into a simpler example, you have a car and you have a bicycle. Which one do you insure? I want you to spend a little time thinking about this. You would obviously be insuring the car, not the bicycle. You see, insurance was made for rich people. It was never made for the poor. Does that mean the poor don't need it? Yes, they do. Because let's say the only thing you have a bicycle. Wouldn't you want to insure that bicycle? But it depends on what is your assets. The more amount of assets you have, the more amount of insurance you need. Insurance was made by the rich, for the rich, to stay rich. And I want you to keep that very clear. Insurance was made specifically for rich people to stay rich. So the richer you are, the more insurance you need. And one of the simplest analogies to explain that, have you seen the movie Titanic? You see, Titanic was supposed to be the ship that never sinks. But when it sank, what was the only thing that protected its passengers was lifeboats. Mr. Klein or Miss Klein, you are the Titanic. I am a lifeboat manufacturer. My job is to make lifeboats for your Titanic. And the bigger the ship, the more lifeboats you need. So Mr. Klein, the bigger you are, the more lifeboats you need. So that's one of the simplest ways to handle that objection. All right. Um, what if I want to sell products to younger generation who are 18 and 25 year olds? They always keep saying, I'm still young. It's too early for me to buy. If I were to fall sick, then my parents would pay all my medical bills. Well, congratulations, you have parents to take care of you. When is the cheapest time to buy insurance? So let's get this all very clear. Um, when is the best time to buy insurance? The best time to buy insurance is one day before you die. Think about it. When is the best time to buy insurance? One day before you die. I die, I buy today and I die tomorrow. It's the maximum return. So the best time to buy insurance is not when you're young, when you're healthy, no, no, no. The best time to buy insurance is one day before you die. The only problem is we actually don't know when that day is. So the best time to buy insurance is yesterday because you can even die or fall sick today. So the best time to buy insurance was yesterday. Unfortunately, we can't turn back time. So the best time to buy insurance is today. So that you don't have the same regret tomorrow. I wish I had insurance yesterday. So guys, just because you're young, stop thinking you're a superman or a superwoman. Things can go bad. And when things do go bad, you need to be protected. So if your parents have already not bought insurance for you, please have this conversation with your parents. Uh, they might not be aware of the opportunities of insurance so that you understand what the purpose of insurance is. Go and spend some time with the parents of these children who are giving you this objection because it only means insurance and financial planning is not a part of their culture in the house. So you might as well spend some time to educate the family on how to do proper holistic financial planning. Um, let me look at some of the other questions that have come up. Right. So I can see a lot of you want the objection and the concept presentation playbook. Well, let me share one thing with you that I, I will be giving books away today. So I want you to tell me which books do you want and why do you want that book? So I can probably have my team, uh, if you win it, I'll have my team send it across to you. Um, all right, I've got some more questions that are coming in. So some of the questions that came in today that I want to spend some time to answer is, um, Sanjay, I'm new in this industry. What are some good starting advices? Well, 
Let me give you some very simple starting advice. Number one is make sure you have built up enough activity because if you don't spend enough time having activity and you spend a lot of time in the office, it is not productive. You need to learn to have a connection. One of the most difficult things that's happening today is con our conversations with our clients are moving on to technology. So instead of having face-to-face -face conversations, we are now having texting conversations. Try to start having regular conversations with people. Sit down with people and have a chat. Leave your phone for a few hours and have a proper conversation with people. We have forgotten to have conversations. We have learned how to text. We have learned how to instant message, but we have forgotten how to have conversations. Spend some time building or learning the art of having a proper conversation. And one of the simplest way to have a conversation or to start a conversation is to have a good presentation. That's what I've documented down in this book for you. So forget all the other books. If you are just starting this business, focus on having proper conversations. Have a proper presentation that you can use with anybody and everybody. If you don't know how to do presentations, go to YouTube. I've already put up the links. Go to YouTube. You can watch some of the presentations that I've already put up, which you can use as conversation starters with your clients. Uh, one of the other questions that's come up is, Sanjay, should I buy leads as an insurance agent? <sighs> Guys, can you imagine a doctor looking for leads and they randomly calling up people and saying, hi, I'm a doctor and do you want some medical advice? Whenever you are trying to become a professional, try to benchmark with a profession that people have trust in. And one of the trusted professions is medical doctors or engineers. You need to be able to say you're one of the best. And it's not about getting leads, it's about asking for the right recommendation. So, if you have the Sales Maximizer playbook, I've written about how to ask for recommendations. One second, yeah? On page number 68. So on page number 68, what I've done is, I've covered two case studies on number one, how do you ask for recommendations and how do you get those recommendations. So if you get recommendations, it is the best type of meeting that you can have. It is better than referrals because let's be honest, referrals are dead. One thing that's definitely happened is referrals are absolutely dead. Today, imagine I go to a client and I say, this is what happened. You see, when I joined this industry, everyone said, Sanjay, get referrals. And I started with that. So I went to some of my clients and I said, okay, can I have a referral? And they said, okay. And they gave me name and number. Now, when I called up that person, the usual answer was, how did you get my number? Why did he give you my number? Or who is that person? The worst questions to be asked. Can you imagine you call someone who you think is a friend of your friend and you call them and you say, hi, I got your number from this friend of yours. And the first question they say, why they gave you my number? Now you're spending 15 minutes talking about why they gave you that number. The easier way is to ask for recommendations. When you are recommended, for example, let me ask you this recommendation. Which is the best restaurant that you would recommend me to eat at? What happens right now? Is that restaurant paying you money to give me that recommendation? No. You're just recommending the one restaurant that you enjoy. And it's exactly the same thing with our prospecting. Please work with people you like. Our contract, life insurance is a contract that is very similar to a marriage contract. Till death do us part. One of us has to die. Through sickness and health, I will be with you. So one of us has to fall sick and we will be there for them. Through rich and poor, I will be with you. If you're rich, I'm with you. If you're poor, don't worry, I will take care of you. That's our job. You see, it's exactly the same thing that we give to our spouses. We are giving those promises to our clients. Would you marry just any person on the street? No. You want to work with someone you like. You have to work with someone you love. You have to work with someone you enjoy meeting on a Monday morning. You all have Monday blues because you're working with people you don't like. So if you like your clients, every day is a Sunday. Why do we look forward to the weekend? That's a weekend when we get to spend time with our family, with our friends. So if you want to spend time with your favorite clients, 
Don't have to worry about it. Work with people you love. That's the most important thing. All right. Let me look at some of the other questions that are coming up. All right. Uh, what is your proven method to acquire new clients? Well, like I just shared, um, I would always use recommendations as a way to acquire new clients. Uh, it just makes it more sincere, it's a lot more effective, and it's a lot more concrete. I want you to do step number one. Step number one is identify who are the types of clients you like to work with. Because if you don't know the type of clients you like to work with, then you think everyone is the client. Let's be honest, there are seven over billion people in the world. You don't want all of them as your clients. You want a few of them as your clients. So why don't you choose who you want as your client? And if those clients are the people you like to work with, you will go an extra mile to take care of them, protect them, and make sure that they are happy with what you do. So follow the recommendation process, because I'll be honest with you, referrals are dead. All right, let me look at some of the questions that have come up. Uh, these days, customers need online policy, not from an insurance agent. Okay, um, there are some insurance products that I promise you should buy online. I'll give you an example. Insurance is very good to buy online for products which are commodity products. Things like car, travel, home, easy to understand products should be purchased online. It's just like buying medicine in case you have a headache or you have a sore throat. You can just buy Panadols, or you can buy Tarastamols, or you can buy Paracetamol products over the shelf. You can buy simple mouthwash products over the shelf. So all the simple products you can buy over the shelf. But let's say you're diagnosed with cancer. Would you like to go with a doctor, which will have a proper treatment plan for you, or would you like to take your own chemotherapy? Think about it. You see, life insurance is a long-term commitment. You want to spend time with a doctor to make sure that one, you're buying the right product. Number two, you're buying a product that will suit exactly what your family needs. I can give you the general rule of thumb, but specific to you, you need to spend with a doctor. So life insurance and financial planning products, you should always buy from an insurance advisor. But commodity products, car insurance, health insurance, travel insurance, home insurance, these are commodity products. You can definitely buy these online because these are simple products to understand unless you have a very complicated car. So for example, let's say you have a limited edition Ferrari. You probably want to spend time with the right insurance advisor who can guide you on which car insurance to buy because that's a limited edition car. You just don't go around buying any car insurance. So it's about understanding what is the product, what is the purpose and how long it's going to stay with you for. So no, you can buy insurance online but there are some products that you cannot buy online. There are some products that are complicated and you want to spend time with a financial advisor to make that decision. And that's how you handle that objection. Um, <clears throat> All right. All right. So there's a very interesting question that's come up. Put more in mutual funds and nominal for life insurance. Sachin has asked this question. Uh, a lot of CFPs are singing this song, What's Your Call? All right, uh, it's a song, so let's sing with it. Understand what is the purpose of term insurance. So term insurance is supposed to protect you for a term of time, so a period of time. How long do you plan to be married to your spouse? If the answer is a term, then you buy it for that term. If your answer is whole life, then you buy it for whole life. So you tell me how long your commitments last for and I will tell you which product you should buy. Is term good? Is whole life bad? We don't know. The answer is you have to use it as a combination. So uh, if you have my 28,000 book, I've actually mentioned this on page number 80. Yes, 
page number 88. I'll read this out to you. A good advisor would recommend a combination of permanent and term insurance. This is a good formula to remember when purchasing insurance. If 10 times of your annual income should be life insurance, 5 times of your annual income can be term and 5 times of your annual income could be permanent. But if you have children, you need 15 times of your annual income as life insurance, 5 times of your annual income can be permanent and 10 times of your annual income can be term. Term is not good, term is not bad. Permanent is not good, permanent is not bad. But as a combination, they work very powerfully. The pros and cons of each product are cancelled if you combine the two products together. Then they become pro and pro. All the cons get cancelled with each other. So it's about positive, negative, positive, negative. When you remove the two negatives, it becomes a positive. So the entire product, the perfect win-win-win situation is you need a combination of term and permanent. You cannot say one is good, one is bad. They both have a different purpose. So understand what is the purpose of that product. All right, uh, let me talk a little bit about, so one of the things that I want you to focus on during Q4 is on retirement planning. One of the things that's changed in retirement planning, and I want this to be very clear with you guys, retirement planning as a book was written with a purpose. As a product, retirement planning has got many different ways of doing it. Number one, you could be using ILPs, investment link plans, or some people call it ULIPs, unit link investment plans. Uh, the other one is you buy annuities, and the third one is you do endowments. Now, understand what's the purpose of retirement. Retirement comes with two very significant purposes. Number one, the strategy for retirement. When and what is the purpose of retirement? That's number one. Understood, understand stage one. Stage one of retirement is self-awareness. Understanding why and when you will retire. When you have that, you have an idea of what's your timeline, what are the things you will depend on, how is your health, there are many things that matter. The second thing you need to understand is, in retirement planning, there are two types of retirement planning. Number one is voluntary retirement, and the second one is involuntary retirement. Now, voluntary retirement is where you choose when you want to retire. So you might say, I will retire at the age of 45, 55, 65, 75, your choice. That is voluntary retirement. But there is something called involuntary retirement, which a lot of people forget when they're doing retirement planning. Involuntary retirement is when you physically are not able to work and you have to retire. So let's say you're 35 and you're hit with a major illness and you have to retire by force. That is what we call involuntary retirement. A lot of people forget that retirement planning has to also take into account involuntary retirement. Now I've already, so I've written that on, if you have the retirement planning playbook, I've already written that on page number, one second, it's right here. It's on page number 24. So on page number 24, what I've done is I've actually written the two types of retirement, which is voluntary retirement, which is a happy situation. I'm gonna read this out to you so you get it. Voluntary retirement is a happy situation because you as an individual get to decide on how you want to spend your life meaningfully with a purpose. It involves finding out when you want to retire and your purpose for retirement. The second is involuntary retirement. This is something you cannot control. Most of the time it occurs because of an illness or an accident where you physically cannot work and need an income to support yourself. Now as an advisor, it is important for us that our clients understand that there are two different types of retirement. They've always been thinking retirement is about saving money and then retiring. It's not true. There are two types. There's voluntary, involuntary. So when I was writing this book, I realized there is theory of retirement and then there's the practical aspects of retirement. You need to have a combination of understanding what is the theory and what are the practical ways of handling retirement planning solutions. So which product should I use? 
All those I have written down in this book. There are three primary products that you can use for retirement planning. I have written the pros and cons. You can use this book with your clients. You can actually share with them that listen, there are many ways to do retirement planning. Did you know there are six sources of income that you can have during retirement? Each of those income sources are different. So use the retirement planning playbook purely to understand how to do retirement planning. So if you haven't got that correct, there's a problem. Now, uh, <coughs> all right, there's a question that's come up. Some clients think that they understand the proposal by reading it themselves via email. How to refute them without offending or showing them the importance of us advisors explaining to them rather than emailing them the presentation and proposals. First of all, you never email presentations. Number two, you never email proposals. What you can do, however, is you can email them a summary. And the whole purpose of a summary is for them to have a one glance view of what you're trying to propose to them. So you can always send a one page summary, but that is something that you write. Please do not just email your illustration, which could be 20, 30 pages, directly to your client. Let me give you an example. Can you imagine you go to a doctor and the doctor writes your prescription and the, you tell the doctor, can you please email me the terms and conditions or the, the benefits on the good and cons of these products? What will they tell you? Go online. First of all, please don't compare Google to my certification. I have spent a lot of time to become a doctor of financial planning. The whole purpose is I want to be the best at what I do and I've spent a lot of time educating myself. What I can do is I can email you a summary but before I email you a summary I need to know is this what you need or am I emailing you something that's not even appropriate. If this is something you need let me process it for you. You have 15 to 21 days of free look to make a decision if this is exactly what you want or you want me to modify it. We have 14 to 21 days of free look to ensure that you have got the right decision made. There is no hurry to make that decision. Take your time. Guys, I just got a question. Sanjay, I don't feel that my clients feel urgency to buy insurance. Let's get one thing very clear. If your clients don't buy insurance today, they buy after one year, what will happen? What will happen? The premium will increase, correct? If the premium increases, does your commission increase? Absolutely yes. So why are you in a hurry? Let your clients take their own sweet time. Don't worry. The only reason why you are in a hurry is because you probably don't have enough activity. You're not meeting enough people. So if this client doesn't buy from you, this month you don't earn any money. So guys, focus on building your activity rate rather than worrying about what your clients are saying. If they tell you, I want to think about it, I would actually tell my clients, you know what, no hurry, plan next year. I'm not in a hurry at all. Because the longer they take, the more money you make. So guys, get that very clear. If the clients don't feel urgency, don't worry. It only means your presentation was not good enough. So your presentation wasn't good, you need to practice your presentation. If your clients don't feel the urgency to make a decision, don't worry. Next year, their premium only increases. If they don't buy from you, they would buy from somebody else. Our job is to be good advisors. I want you to spend a lot of time advising and educating your clients. The more time you spend advising and educating your client, the better your branding, your own presentation skills, and your own personal skills will improve. As they improve, you will get a higher closing rate. So get that very clear. What if a client says, I'm not an insurance believer? Well, <laughs> insurance is not, uh, is not a religion as they say, you know? Insurance is not a religion. I'm sure you've heard this before, but insurance is not a religion. There's nothing to believe or not believe in. Uh, the only question is, do you want to protect your income or not? Uh, there are two ways to protect the income. You protect it yourself by doing what we call self-insurance. Or you can transfer the risk to a bigger company that can take the risk of you losing your income. So the choice is yours. You either keep the risk to yourself or you transfer the risk to a third party which is way bigger than you are and can carry and handle that risk. 
If you don't buy the insurance, it doesn't affect the insurance company. But if you buy the insurance, it protects you. So the choice is yours. There's nothing about believing or not believing it. It's not a religion. I'm sure you've heard that before. So don't worry about that. Uh, I'm again being asked this question. Sanjay, how do I do cold canvassing? Guys, I don't do cold canvassing. And for a simple reason, if I don't love you, I don't care about you, let's be honest, what's going to happen? Every, there are thousands of people who die every day. All we can probably do every day is pray for them. There's nothing much that we can do. So insurance is very good for people that you love. You will go out of the way to protect them. You will go out of the way to provide them good service. You will go out of the way to give them good advice. And that's the purpose of insurance. You got to take care of people that you love. Um, educate people who you don't love. So people you don't care about, you don't love them, educate them. Let them go and find someone that they like to work with. You are a doctor of financial planning. If a client wants to work with you, they will work with you. If they don't want to work with you, you cannot force them to work with you. Life insurance or investment planning or even retirement planning, financial planning is like a marriage. It's still death do us part. Please work with clients you love because then you will not have Monday blues. You will have beautiful Saturdays and Sundays every single day of the week. So please remember that. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people leave this industry. They're not happy with who they work with. So if they don't enjoy who they work with, they will leave this business. So if you have team members who are in your team, share this video with them so they understand. Tag three friends that you believe will find value in this video. Join them and teach them what is the purpose of financial planning. Alright, Sevudin, I love your question. What if client says, I will contact you if I like it? What do you like? Uh, that's one of the reasons why you have to focus on presentation. You see, presentation leads to objections, which leads to closing. It is never about the product. Stop focusing on product. Focus on the plan. If you focus on the plan, the product becomes irrespective. I'll give you an example. Let's say you go to a doctor and the doctor prescribes you a medicine. What do they tell you? After seven days, come back. Let me see if the medicine is working. If the medicine is not working, what do they do? They change the medicine. You don't change the doctor, you change the medicine. So it's not about whether you like the medicine or not. The question is, is the medicine working or not? If the medicine is working, we continue. If the medicine is not working, we will change the medicine. Five years ago, there was X medicine. Five years later, there might be another medicine which is better. So never focus on the medicine, always focus on the plan. And that's why the concept presentation, it is not about product presentation. It's concepts that you have to present. The concept presentation is what keeps you attracted and attached to your clients. It is never about the product. It's always about the concept. So focus on the concept rather than the product. Your sales will be better. Uh, hi Praveen, uh, some, some clients say mutual funds are better than insurance. Uh, Okay, there are two different products. You cannot compare mutual funds with insurance. Insurance is a mechanism to protect income. Mutual funds is a mechanism to grow income. There are two different things. You can only invest in mutual funds if you have an income. If your income stops, your investments in mutual funds will stop. Insurance is a way to protect your future income, income that you have not yet even earned. That is the purpose of insurance. You cannot compare the two. Mutual funds, is an investment strategy. Insurance is a way to protect the income that will support the investment strategy. So don't have to worry about that. One of the other questions that's come up is, Sanjay, how do I approach older prospects? You see, when you work with older prospects, one of the things that you want to focus on is the concept presentation that you use. And for this, I use what we call the flow of water presentation. Now, I've already done this presentation on YouTube, so let me not spend this time talking about the flow of water presentation. Go to YouTube, type the flow of water presentation, watch that presentation. I've written word by word exactly how to do that presentation when you're working with older clients. Because it's always about income, it is not about assets. Let me ask you a question. 
I give you $10 million right now, or I give you $1 million every year for the rest of your life, which one would you prefer? I want you to think about this question. It's a very important question. All our life, we have been told financial planning is about asset accumulation, asset preservation, asset distribution. When the reality is nobody cares about assets, they all care about income. It is always about income accumulation. You want to accumulate a lot of income from different types of assets, real estate, bonds, stocks, mutual funds, annuities, insurance policies. There are so many different ways to build an income. So accumulate more and more income. Remember the, re the root entries, make sure your roots are very strong. So it's always about income accumulation. From income accumulation, you move to income preservation. And the best way to preserve income is to buy life insurance. Life insurance is a tool to preserve and protect income. And then is about income distribution. What do you want to leave for your retirement and for your children? Make sure you have a lot of income that is distributed towards you and towards your family. What would you like to leave for your children? I want you to think about this. Uh, property, or would you prefer them leaving an asset that gives them income every year for the rest of their life? Think about it. I want you to spend a little time thinking the difference between assets and income. All right, now let me look at some of the other comments that have come in. All right, guys, uh, I'll be answering one more question and after that, um, I will have to take your leave because I need to get back to my sales. Um, all right, the last question that I'm answering that has come up is, how do I, how do you determine the appropriate amount of life insurance for someone? Um, guys, I want you to focus on one thing, the rule of thumb. If you understand the rule of thumb, there are four rules of thumb. We have four products. I, you die, I pay. You fall sick, I pay. You retire, I pay. And your kids go to college, I pay. What is the rule of thumb? Number one, for life insurance, 10 times of annual income. For income protection, five times of your annual income. For retirement planning, 20% of whatever you earn, you should save. And for your kids' education, two to 5% of whatever you earn, you should be saving for your kids' education. Remember the rules of thumb. They're the easiest way to start a conversation with your client. Focus on the concepts and presentations. And if you have any more questions, throw them to me. I will definitely answer them for you. Now, the last person that I'm giving away uh, a book to is going to be Shirley Wong, who is going to get the objection playbook because that's what you asked for. So, guys, all the people who have won the books, my team will be getting in touch with you. And for those of you who are meeting at the final sprint between the 20th and 30th of October, I look forward to seeing you at the final sprint where I'll be sharing my closed door strategy on how I did my final sprint and you can use it for yourself. So I look forward to seeing you at the final sprint which will be between the 20th and 30th of October. Take care guys. God bless.